Thank you, Mitch. And it's uh, really an honor to be here at the first Bob Comis um, Translational Science Symposium. Uh, Bob had been a beacon for so many of us for so many years, and I think through the symposium really continues to be. So um, I believe in data. Uh, I think the data helps us to understand what we're doing and what, what we're doing well and what we're doing not so well. Uh, and it's an area I think that we've struggled with. So we've heard some very eloquent uh, talks in the last few minutes. I'm going to get down a little bit into the weeds where we all live uh, day to day. Uh, these are just four of the um, data sources that many of us use to do our work. Um, and they're very different. There are the cancer registries. Uh, and those are manually curated by cancer registrars, have very good staging and surgery and radiation data, not such good systemic data, not such good toxicity data, and are not terribly timely. Uh, the EHRs uh, have a lot of clinical data in them, but much of those data are, in fact, in free text uh, and not very accessible for those of us who would like to use them. Uh, there are financial systems, and we do a lot of work out of them because they tell us what happens to the patients and how much it costs. And then, as all you know, we have clinical trial data, which is a tremendous amount of very detailed curated data, but really on a subset of patients who are receiving a subset of the treatments that we deal with. So. I think part of the problem that we have, um, and Naomi talked about some of the good things about the UK, we're a very siloed uh, group in the US. We're not so organized in those types of ways. But I think one of the things to think about is how we spend our time and how we spend our money accumulating data. And so cancer registries are done manually by cancer registrars who manually enter all the data into them year after year after year. Uh, they feed some of the big databases for the CDC and things like the National Cancer Database. People like me, clinicians, and like many of you, sit there and type the data into EPIC and other EHRs uh, painstakingly every day in clinic. Uh, but much of that data, um, again, is uh, free text data, but we've manually put it in. Uh, for a lot of the quality work we do nationally in our local institutions, that's manually pulled out by our quality teams. Uh, the payers uh, are asking us to get on the phone and tell us what's going on with their patients before they'll agree to pay for the uh, treatment. And then clinical trials, as all you know, you have a group of CRCs or CRAs who are manually abstracting data, putting them in forms, and submitting them. So that's not such a good system. We have a tremendous amount of manual work and manual data. Um, and I would suggest that we need to figure out different ways to use our data, to enter our data. It has to be done, though, in ways that, in fact, make our systems um, more efficient and not less efficient because we can't afford the additional costs and for those of us working in clinic or the cancer registries, we can't afford uh, to spend more and more of our time on administrative burden rather than doing uh, what it is we need to do. So I want to tell you about a couple of very disparate things, but they are ways I think we can think about how to go from our current state to a state that would be better. And the first thing I wanted to mention to you is a project called MCODE, uh, which some of you may know about, and that uh, stands for Minimal Common Oncology Data Elements. And this is an effort that is led by ASCO, uh, the Alliance Cooperative Group, and looking for um, collaboration with you, uh, the FDA, and a company called MITRE, which I'll come back to. Um, ASCO is supplying the administrative support MITRE is doing the heavy lifting from a technology point of view, and we have a number of us at academic centers who are working with them to try to develop pilots to test uh, what we want to have uh, happen. Uh, just a word about MITRE, it's a nonprofit organization. It does a lot of work for the um, Department of Defense and other uh, aspects, and it's frankly very skilled, but doing all of this 
for us uh, in pro bono style, which has really been very, very helpful. And everything that they're developing will be open source uh, so that we'll all get to use it. Uh, this is a schematic of uh, how we think about the work. And if you look at the internal part of the circle, um, have the patient, the disease, the genomics, the treatment, the outcomes, things that we want to know. And on the outside are the stakeholders, the providers, the patients, the payers, uh, the registries, the vendors. Uh, and so it is, you know, we have these data inside. How do we interact uh, with all the stakeholders? And uh, the way that we do that is to define the elements and figure out how to get them into EHRs in structured data rather than free text data so that they can be extracted for various purposes. And we have a number of MCODE uh, projects. We believe in pilots because we figure that that's really the use cases that will tell us what works and what doesn't work. Uh, the first I'm going to come back to, which is uh, a clinical trials project, the goal of which is to have uh, case report forms filled out automatically by extracting data out of the EHR, and come back to that in a minute. Um, we're interested in being able to pull out data out of the EHR to do quality work, to feed registries, to help us to understand real world data, what's happening to a lot of our patients outside of clinical trials, and then pathways to help us to better uh, support clinicians with decision support, but also to be able to measure adherence to pathways. And uh, people like me who oversee a large clinical oncology system are very interested in uh, assessing that throughout um, our system. So what about clinical trials, uh, since that's what a lot of you spend a lot of your time doing? Um, Peter and I were talking about this. For those of us who are really old, um, and, um, and I'm in that category, uh, we've gone through these phases of uh, feeling like, oh my God, we're collecting all these data. We have, you know, 600 CRAs who are collecting it, and most of the data we never use. They fill out all the little boxes in the sheets, and, you know, two years, five years, ten years down the line, 90 percent of the data we never really looked at. So then we got to a minimalist point of view a number of years ago where we said, let's just collect the data that we're absolutely sure that we need. And then inevitably, five years down the line, somebody says, geez, I wish we would have asked about blah, blah, and could go back and find that piece of information. So it's been this waxing and waning effort. I've largely, through most of my career, been associated with what was CLGB and Alliance, but I know that um, in the breast group, which is the group I lived in, uh, we've gone back and forth about this over many years. So, um, you know, right now we're in a very inefficient uh, and not ideal state. And what about the possibility of, in fact, just being able to pull a lot of data out of an EHR about your patients on clinical trials, a lot more than we have now, and do it on an ongoing basis for many, many years to really find out what their outcomes are uh, much further down the line and in a way that is much more detailed. So uh, the Alliance Group has picked two trials uh, to do as an experiment. Uh, the trial on the left is a brain METS trial that is being uh, led by Priscilla Brastianos at the Mass General Hospital, and the trial on the right is a vitamin D trial being led by Kimmy Ng at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And at Penn, uh, with Peter's uh, support and uh, blessing, uh, we plan on participating in the brain METS uh, trial. The details of the trial are not important uh, right now, and certainly we'd love for you to participate in it. The important part is that this trial, one, can only be done at centers that are using EPIC um, as their EHR because we are working with EPIC to develop a facile way of entering the data into uh, the EHR that we think are critical for the case report forms. And we'll do not a randomized trial, but a comparative trial where we'll have standard case report forms and we'll have the EPIC extracted data and we'll be able to compare them. 
and see um, how we've done. Uh, if it works, um, I think it will be a great boon and be something that could be expanded. So I think that's something worth thinking about. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. I'd love to talk about this for the next two hours, uh, but this is a lot of what's very, very interesting to me, uh, which are big data, uh, to look at uh, real world data and how we're doing, and you're going to hear, hear from Neil uh, Maripol later in the afternoon some about this, but I helped to oversee the National Cancer Database with 37 million patients in it. That's all registry data. It's got some great stuff in it, and it's missing some really key elements that we would love to have. Likewise, SEER. And then we have a couple of big EHR databases, including ASCO's CancerLink and Flatiron, which Neil will talk to you a little bit about. Um, none of these data sets are perfect. They're really, in some respects, complementary. Some of them do some things better than others. Uh, but none of them really have everything that we want in one single data set. And I think things like M code can help us to get there. So I wanted to just tell you a little bit in the last few minutes about some things that we're doing at Penn um, to try to get us to a better place in pilots. Um, one is what we call oncology assessments. We originally called it Onc Vitals uh, for the vital signs of our cancer patients, and we got uh, abused by the people who believe in the standard vital signs. Um, and so this is a six-click box. It's a smart form in EPIC. Uh, and it tells us whether the patient's got metastatic disease, uh, what the clinical uh, status is of the patient's cancer, uh, whether it's getting better or worse, whether it's a first regional recurrence or a first distant recurrence, performance status, clinical um, uh, assessment, what um, phase of their treatment or follow-up they're in, and whether we're treating them with curative intent or not. This takes us um, probably less than uh, 15 seconds to complete, uh, and then that could be dumped into your um, uh, clinic note with a smart phrase. And we're starting to play around with this, and the box on the top is what it looks like in Epic. The bo box on the bottom is what it looks like in your clinic note. Um, and it's pretty nice and easy to refer to. It's all structured data that could be pulled out. And I, what I would think about when you're thinking about your case report forms is how many of the questions does this answer um, that would help you to know what you'd want to know about the patient in a clinical trial or any other circumstance. The other thing that I wanted to mention was patient reported outcomes, which uh, we're now collecting on all of our cancer patients at every visit, that we only collect it once a week. If they come in multiple times a week, they only have to do it once. Um, and we are now using just a standard form, though we're starting to customize it by disease and phase of treatment. But we ask them 14 different questions. We ask them at every visit. They can do it through the patient portal. Um, or they can do it while they're waiting uh, for their appointment on a tablet, gets fed into Epic, and uh, what's on the right is uh, a real one that's extracted from one of my patient's clinic notes that gives you the answers to all these. It also tells you what the patient's worried about and what they want to talk about. Again, this is all structured data, and we now have a huge amount of these data. We've done something like 65,000 uh, patient reported outcome events, uh, which we can start to look at uh, within our system. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to talk to you about Penny. This gets into the, um, what we've called augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, because we look at this as, um, as uh, an adjunct uh, to clinical care. Uh, but Penny is a text-based uh, AI conversational chatbot. Um, it uses natural language processing, it uses algorithms, which I'll talk about briefly, and adaptive rules engines and machine learning. And we've trialed this initially on patients who are receiving oral chemotherapy for GI tumors. Uh, we picked a complicated regimen, which was the capecitabine temozolomide regimen for uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which is a challenge. And, um, 
This is just what it looks like uh, on um, their uh, screen, but uh, it sort of says, you know, hi, Julie, this is Penny. How you doing today? I see you're supposed to start your uh, oral chemotherapy tomorrow. Why don't we have you take it at 7 in the morning and 8 at night, and I'll check in with you uh, tomorrow. And then uh, on the next day, um, Uh, on the next day, it actually pops up at the right times, and it tells them which pills to take. If they need it, they'll show them which pills uh, look like what. Uh, and for those of you who uh, know about uh, capecitabine, it's a complicated regimen with multiple pill sizes. But it takes them through all of that in a way where we've been able to show that we think that adherence uh, to appropriate uh, dosing is actually much better uh, than it has been. And then finally, it manages um, toxicities. And it will manage low-grade toxicities on its own through an algorithm. And it will manage high-grade toxicities by escalating it uh, to the clinical team. So you know, if they have low-grade nausea, it asks them whether they're taking their nausea medicine and when they took it last, and so on and so forth. And um, we, um, we have this algorithm which um, looks complicated, but it takes care of most of the things that the patients have complained about. And again, it's been a machine learning type of process over a period of time. And um, anything that Penny doesn't understand automatically gets escalated to the clinical teams. Uh, though it's not been a lot of that, we did have a little bit of a crisis around the Super Bowl in 2017 when on Monday morning the patients were saying, hey, Penny, what do you think about the Eagles beating the Patriots? Um, and that turned out not to be anywhere in the algorithm. Uh, but we're not sure whether that's going to ever happen again. So it might not be a long-term problem. Um, whoops. So how is this done? Uh, very, very high patient acceptance. They actually loved it. Some of our patients, uh, like the Super Bowl patient, forgets that uh, Penny is actually a chat bot and not a real person. You know, hi, Penny, how was your weekend? Uh, some of the feedback that we get. Uh, we know that it's reduced calls to the practices because it's taken care of a lot of things. We know that it's reduced emergency department visits in our patients. And um, we know that, uh, at least by self-reporting, it's improved the uh, adherence uh, for drug administration. And one of the things that I would say to you as a clinical trials group is the amount of data that we have on adherence and on toxicities and on quality of life is extraordinary. And when you're thinking about how to better understand how your patients are doing on clinical trials, I think this is a potentially very, very powerful tool. So I think we need to get to a better place. We need more efficiency. We need better data. Um, I think we can do that, but it's going to require a different way for all of us to think um, and to think about change. Uh, and I know change is hard. We talked about this a little last night. But, um, but I think we can do it. So with that, I'm going to end. And thank you very, very much for having me as part of the symposium.